If you have your Bibles, we continue with our How to Interpret the Bible series. And this morning, we're going to deal with the very important subject of the confusion that develops when people approach the Bible with a totally different world view than the Bible has. Now, the Bible has a world view. The worldview of the Bible is that there is one God that is the creator of all things, that he loved us and sent his son to save us, and that he told us about himself and his word enough so that we could believe, that we could obey, and that we could live together with our fellow man, ministering to them and as a witness to others, to carry his message to the ends of the earth. Now, the Bible worldview is a very simple declarative, forceful, all-embracing worldview. God is the God of the galaxies, not just the God of Earth. He is the creator of all things. The worldview of the Bible is that the gospel of the kingdom is the supreme maxim of the church age. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. What gospel? The gospel of the kingdom, that the kingdom of heaven is in the midst of you. The kingdom of heaven is going to rule and that his kingdom will come, his will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Dr. James Sire, a very fine writer, dealing with the confusion in hermeneutics, that is the science of biblical interpretation, on world views, makes this interesting statement. He says there is a confusion about world views all around us. Scriptural statements, stories, commands, or symbols which have a particular meaning or set of meanings when taken within the intellectual and broadly cultural framework of the Bible itself are lifted out of that context. They are placed within the frame of reference of another system and thus given a, ma a meaning that markedly differs from their intended meaning. Translation in simple language. The biblical worldview is prostituted and corrupted by other individuals and systems that recognize what it is but reject it. But in order to communicate what they want, they use quotations from the Bible and the biblical worldview, but they have nothing to do with the subject at all. Illustration. I have met tens of thousands of cultists literally tens of thousands of cultists and occultists in 38 years of ministry. Talked with them, answered their questions, been in their headquarters, studied with them, in order to learn how they think. I don't think that I have ever been in a cultic or occultic situation that they haven't quoted to me this verse from the Lord Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew. The kingdom of heaven is within you. And you say, well, that's a biblical quote. Jesus did say that. The kingdom of heaven is within you. That's the biblical world view. God's kingdom is within the soul or the very being of God's people. It is also in the midst of us, in the sense that corporately the church is indwelt by the Holy Spirit. We all recognize that. But when the cultist and the occultist uses the term, the kingdom of heaven is in you, it's a different world view, and the confusion enters immediately. Example, Maharishi Mahesh Yoga, Transcendental Meditation, one of the biggest Hindu systems operating in the United States today. Quotes in his book, Meditations of Maharishi Mahesh Yoga. Quote, Be still and know that I am God. Obviously a quotation from the Psalms. Be still and know that I am God. Psalm 46. And the Maharishi says, Now, you must understand that the meaning of this passage is that you must meditate upon the fact that you are Godhood. You are deity, and the kingdom of heaven is within 
you. Now you see the two worldviews? The biblical worldview is that the kingdom of heaven comes from without God into the world, lives in our midst, in us, and is being worked out by the Holy Spirit, and it will consummate in the second coming of Jesus Christ. That's the biblical worldview. Can't miss it. The Maharishi takes it, be still and know that I am God, to mean that you are deity. Hindu worldview. Everybody is God. And the kingdom of heaven is within you because you are deity. Got it? Yuck. Now, that is a perfect illustration of how you have two worldviews, one based in Scripture and the other based in Hinduism. But they're both quoting the same verses. And unless you get the right worldview, you are not going to be able to understand what they're talking about. I have met people who with absolutely innocent faces have told me that they never learned so much Scripture as when they were in a cult. Of course they learned a lot of Scripture in the cult. Because the cult takes the Scripture in a different context or worldview, and what they hear is the Scripture and the perversion of it. And they don't realize that we're not talking about the same thing. Let me illustrate. On television, every once in a while, there's a program featuring a lady called Elizabeth Clare Prophet. How many people have you have seen her on television? Okay. That is the Church Universal and Triumphant, or the Mighty I Am Cult. Elizabeth Clare Prophet is really Joan Wolfe from Brooklyn, who married a guy named Prophet. P-R-O-P-H-E-T. And became Elizabeth Clare, prophet. Okay. Elizabeth Clare, prophet, on television, looks right into the camera in this dull monotone, sitting in her consultation chair, surrounded by all her occultic symbols and colors. And she looks into the camera, and she says, what you must do is affirm the I am presence which is within you and the affirmation of the I am presence within you, even as Jesus affirmed the I am principle within him, uh, will give you access to the wisdom of the ascended masters. <laughs> now, now, first of all, Jesus did use the term I am. John 8, she quotes it. Before Abraham was, I am. All right. What does I am mean within the biblical worldview? Question. You ready? What does it mean? Exodus 3, 14. Moses said to God, Whom shall I say has sent me when I go back to Egypt? And God answered Moses from the burning bush and said, I am that I am. This is my name forever, my memorial to all generations. I am hath sent me unto you. That's the biblical worldview. Who is the I am? God himself. What does the I am become in the context of Elizabeth Clare Prophet's Hinduism? The I am becomes the true deity of each one of us. So we have to affirm the I am principle or the God principle in us. And once we affirm the I am principle in us and we recognize that we are deity and we have Godhood, then all things are possible to us. Now, there's your two worldviews. One, biblical. The I am is God who appeared in human flesh in Jesus Christ. Nowhere does the Bible say that you are I am. I am, I am. Garbage. But if you don't know that, and you're listening to Elizabeth Clare Prophet, you must affirm the I am principle. Jesus affirmed the I am principle. Well, Jesus did affirm I am. But in their worldview, it means you're God. Just like the Maharishi said. So you have exactly the same thing. So you have to be careful, says Dr. Sire, and he's right, of your worldview, where you're at. Christian science, for instance, does exactly the same thing. 
in which Mrs. Eddy will tell you that there is no life, truth, intelligence, or substance in matter. And you, as the reflection of God, created in God's image and likeness, are God. How do you like that one? I was talking to a Christian science practitioner one time. The practitioner said, you must understand, God is love. And love is God. And I said, what? God is love, and love is God. And you prove the proposition by reversibility. By what? Reversibility. God is love is reversed to love is God. Now, any first-year course in logic would destroy this instantaneously. All rabbits are quadrupeds. But all quadrupeds are not rabbits. <laughs> and you cannot say that you prove a proposition by reversing it. <laughs> love is God. God is love. You can't do it grammatically. The grammar of the Greek New Testament will never let you say, love is God. God is love. And it's put there for the purpose of explaining to you that true love can only be expressed in deity, and that God is love, and God became incarnate love in the person of Jesus Christ. You want to know what the love of God is? Look at the Lord Jesus. Look at him when he met the woman at the well. That's the love of God. Look at him when he met the people who were diseased. That's the love of God. Look at him when he met the demons. That's the love and power of God. In other words, Christ was the love of God in human flesh. But you cannot take a biblical proposition and reverse it and prove its truth by reversing it. Doesn't work. Doesn't work grammatically, doesn't work logically. But you see, the cults don't know that, know that because they have a different worldview. Now, why do you suppose I take the time and the energy on a Sunday morning in a Bible class to teach interpretation of the Bible? Because if you learn how to interpret it, you will never be misled by this stuff. It's because Christians don't know simple rules and recognition for interpretation that we've got half the cults we have now. And we've got 34 to 50 million of them and they ain't going away. They're getting bigger, more powerful and proliferating. I have one other illustration which I think also demonstrates this. Confusion of definition fits right in with world, a confused worldview. If you have confused definitions, you're going to have a confused theology. If you read Edgar Cayce, the great sleeping prophet who healed people in trances and was a Presbyterian Sunday school teacher on Sundays and a clairvoyant, occultist, demon-possessed healer the rest of the week. That's Cayce. His Association for Research and Enlightenment puts out all kinds of literature on being born again. Casey uses the phrase, born again. People hear the phrase, born again. They say, oh, well, Casey certainly must have been orthodox because he's talking about people being born again. You're a vacuum head if you think that. <laughs> what you have to do is read Casey to find out what Casey means by born again. Not only is his worldview confused, but Casey's definitions are confused. Do you know what born again means, Edgar Casey? To be born again in Edgar Casey's theology is to pass through a cycle of rebirth so that you appear on earth in another body. The new birth to Casey is reincarnation. But he uses the term John 3 and quotes John 3. Jesus said, you must be born again. And Casey says, and you must be born again. Jesus himself was born again. Does that sound familiar? It ought to. Kenneth Hagin, Kenneth Copeland say the same thing. The doctrine of the born again Jesus. Jesus had to be born again to be your Savior. That's a damnable lie. Jesus never had to be born again because the only people who have to be born again are the people who are sinners. Jesus never sinned. He bore in his own body our sins on the tree. But he vicariously bore them. He suffered for us. He never became a sinner. In fact, the Hebrew book of Hebrews says, 
God made him to become the sin offering for us who knew no sin. All right, now, these are two important points you want to note on biblical interpretation. A confused worldview will confuse all your terminology. And your confused terminology will confuse your witness and your capacity to understand Scripture or to communicate it. So write down the word confusion. And next to it, worldview, definitions. And then next to that, God is not the author of confusion. You see, the purpose of biblical study, as a professor of it, I can tell you this with some degree of authority, the purpose of biblical studies is not just to expand the scope of your knowledge of Scripture, but to give you the message of the Scripture in its context, in its proper worldview, so that you can get what God is telling you. But when you superimpose on the Bible other philosophies, other writers, other teachers, other religions, you are destroying the biblical worldview. You are perverting the biblical worldview to make it say what you want it to say rather than letting it speak for itself. So when somebody tells you that they believe in the new birth, why don't you unconfuse them by finding out what the new birth is and telling them what the Scripture says? When somebody talks about the kingdom of heaven is within you, say that's absolutely right. The kingdom of heaven is within you if, if you are doing the will of God. And then you say to the person, do you know what the will of God is? The person says, well, uh, what, what do you mean do I know what it is? Well, don't you know Jesus told us what the will of God was? No. What, what did Jesus say? This is the will of him that sent me, that everyone that sees me and believes in me may have eternal life. He that believes in the Son has everlasting life. And he that will not obey the Son will never even see life. The wrath of God continues to abide upon him. We have got to return to unconfused worldview, unconfused definition, and solid, good old, consistent biblical theology. You must be born again means you have got to be transformed by faith in Jesus Christ. You must obey the will of God. If you're going to talk about it, obey it and live it. And if you are doing that, that will be sufficient evidence that you have passed out of death into life. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples. If you're Baptist, Methodist, Lutherans, Assembly of God, Episcopalian, Evangelical, Free, no. If you have love one for another. And by this you will be a good Bible student. Test all things and hold fast to that which is good. Whoever has ears to hear, hear what the Spirit says to the church. I don't know whether you realize it or not, but by teaching this type of material and lining this out for you, you are probably the only Bible class in the United States that has ever gotten a course on biblical hermeneutics outside of seminary or Bible college. And I'm giving you principles that you can't even begin to evaluate until you start applying them. So I like to preach topically. I like to do book studies, but until I finish teaching how to interpret it, you are stuck with this, and I hope that it will be profitable to you. Our Father, we worship you. Because of the privilege of being able to study and show ourselves approved by God, a workman who does not need to blush with embarrassment, rightly interpreting the word of truth. Our Father, if there's anybody here this morning that does not realize the blunt truth of the gospel, you must be born again. Except a man be born of water, even of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Oh, Lord, touch their hearts and give them neither rest nor peace until they shall make their peace with you. Upon thy children this morning who love you, meet their needs according to thy riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And bless this class and we here who seek to serve you through Christ our Lord. Amen.